Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us again this Wednesday night. Uh, as you know, we've been taking a look at uh, some Bible stories, looking at the text, and looking at it in particular through Eastern or Hebrew eyes, and uh, discovering, I think, together that uh, our doctrine or belief or theology uh, doesn't really change dramatically. But um, when we take into account cultural context, what it meant to the writers who wrote the text then, and to those first hearers of God's word, that it can add, I think, meaningfully and even practically in some ways to those doctrines and theology that we hold dear. Um, I'd like to invite you, as is our practice, to stand, and we'll begin our study today by reciting Shema together. We'll still do the Hebrew responsively, although I know your Hebrew is getting better as we go along, and then we'll recite it in English together. So first, uh, let's... Um, Witness to God and to anyone, really, who can hear us, who it is and what we're doing here by reciting Shema together, responsively first in Hebrew. Please say these words after me. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Eloweka. Behol Lavavka, Uvahol Nafshaka, Uvahol Meodecha, Uveahafta Reacha Komocha. Amen. Together now in English, please. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Amen. Please uh, be seated. With uh, Good Friday and Resurrection Day still fresh on our hearts and minds, I'd like to share with you a story today, one that I first heard, at least in this fashion, 22 years ago. Uh, the story means a lot to me. It, um, I can show you yet today the rock in Israel that I was sitting on when God reached me through a man named Ray Vanderlaan with this story in particular. And I hope uh, it means something to you uh, as well. It's a story about God's sovereignty it's a story about God's love. Almost all God's stories are about each. And uh, it's also a story, I think, that can answer a question that maybe many of us have from time to time, especially during hard and challenging times. And that question, you could ask it a lot of ways, but it goes something like this. Do you ever wonder if somehow, sometime, uh, God forgets you. Maybe you're wondering that even right now. Do you wonder if he's thinking about you right now? I wonder that sometimes when life gets particularly tough, and I'll find myself in prayer to the Lord asking him, God, where are you? If you ever feel like that too, then this story maybe is one you can remember the next time you're feeling like that, that maybe you're wondering, the enemy tempts you into thinking, you know what, God has somehow forgotten about you. The story that I'm about to tell is a true story. It's in the Bible, and it's one of those Bible stories that when you read it or hear it for the first time or maybe even several times, there's parts to the story that seem a little bit strange to our more modern Western ears and maybe don't seem to make much sense, uh, kind of like the book, uh, the book of Leviticus maybe uh, for many of us. And I want to emphasize um, 
that the story I'm telling, um, I'm giving it one interpretation. Uh, it's an interpretation that especially looks through Hebrew eyes. But uh, you should, when you have time, go and read the scriptures for yourself that I'll reference quickly here. Talk to, ask your pastors or, or other biblical experts. Uh, test your own heart uh, because there are many interpretations out there. In my opinion, um, this one's my favorite among many others, and those others can bring added insight, I think, to God's Word, too. But the reason why I love this interpretation, or it's my favored one, I suppose you could say, it seems to me of all the interpretations I've heard, this one is most consistent with and affirming of all of Scripture, which uh, it seems to me is a key and pivotal test of any interpretation. Which one binds together and is most consistent with all of Scripture? And I think this story does that. Before I get much further into the story, I need to welcome a friend that I have here today for us. Um, he's not on camera, and um, we're practicing social distancing, right, Frankie? Uh, his name is Frankie D. Simone. He's with Church in the Wind here in the Denver area, and um, he is an expert blower of the shofar, the uh, biblical trumpet, and there'll be a time toward the end of the lesson where you'll hear Frankie blowing the horn, the shofar. Uh, you won't see him, but I wanted to recognize and thank Frankie for being here. Uh, the knowledge that he has, the years he's put into studying this pivotal biblical instrument um, is quite impressive. Uh, he and I have been talking leading up to this lesson. If we continue, as some have been talking, our Sunday school lessons uh, sometime in the summer, I'd love to invite you, Frankie, to come in and give us um, much, much more on shofar and what that means uh, in the biblical story. So thank you for being here, Frankie, with us tonight. Um, our story begins in Genesis. A man named Abram is pretty much hanging out in the desert, and God suddenly shows up, and he lays this on Abram. God says to him, Abram, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Now, there's the mother of all things that God ever asked anyone, yes? This has to be the mother of all responsibilities, right? God says to Abram, Abram, be perfect. Now, I don't have to wonder too long to wonder if Abram was maybe thinking something like, great, anything else that you'd like me to do while I'm at it? Things to do today, be perfect. Oh my goodness. But that's what God said. For you see, there was a different time that God came to Abram and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. Now, you might think that in response to that, Abram might say, Thanks, God. But Abram is Jewish, so instead he, sell, he says, Well, what good does that do me? I don't have any kids. This is called chutzpah. Go ahead and say chutzpah. One of the many words that the text scripture has for faith. We combine many of these wonderful biblically Hebrew words for faith into one English word faith. Great study sometime would be to look at the different nuances through Hebrew eyes and different ways to describe faith with different words. But this one here, probably chutzpah. Uh, in English, we might say that in Abram's response to God, he had some nerve. I mean, God comes and says, I'm your shield and great reward. And Abram responds, 
I don't have any kids. Wow, Abram, maybe to our Western ears that seems to be irreverent or something, but I tell you, um, that's the chutzpah, that's the type of faith that God not only welcomes, but he just deeply desires from us at times, and so there's Abram showing his chutzpah. God takes Abram's response in stride, and he says back to Abram, look up, Abram, see all those stars, that's how many descendants you'll have. And Abram says, that's good enough for me. And then God says, Abram, what's more, I am going to give you this amazing land. And Abram, of course, responds, land? What land? I don't have any land. How will I know for sure I'll get this land? And at that response from Abram, I imagine God thinking something like, okay, Abram, you want to know for sure that I'll give you this land? And so God tells Abram a curious thing. Go and get me a cow, a goat, a sheep, a dove, and a pigeon. Well, now that seems like a strange thing for God to ask Abram to go and get, doesn't it? And then it gets even more strange. Abram, without a single word, without any more questions, well, he not only goes and gets those five animals, but he does something really strange to them. He takes each animal and he cuts them in half. Not this way in half, but this way in half, from head to tail. And he arranges those animals in such a way that the blood from each half drains and collects between the halves in a little depression or trail in the dirt. A sort of a path of blood forms. And Abram does this without any further instruction from God, at least not that we have recorded in the Bible. Well, don't you think that's a bit odd? What is Abram doing, and how does he know to do that? And here's one of those areas where cultural, contextual eyes can really help us out. In my opinion, one interpretation is Abram does this because he understands as soon as God mentions those animals what God is about to do. He knows that God is about to make a covenant, a promise, so that Abram will know for sure he's going to get the land as God has said. Abram, in other words, he understands what has to happen to make a covenant in the culture of the day. And so that's, I think, how Abram knows what to do. Now, let me tell you another story within this one to help explain what Abram was up to. Here's what happened in Abram's day when someone wanted to make a covenant. For this story, I need to ask you to come with me in your mind to an ancient Bedouin camp. We've been invited there um, by the family of Bedouins in that camp. Sunset is coming and someone builds a big bonfire in the main open square. And there's a lot of people there. The Bedouins' extended family is there. And the spirit of the evening with the bonfire is one of celebration. And everyone's talking excitedly, they're catching up with each other, and it's just a fun time out in the desert with these amazingly hospitable Bedouin. And then as we look around and the party is happening, another family shows up. And they show up coming across the desert and join in the party and celebration. And so now two families are there. 
And then we notice that suddenly it gets very quiet. And we notice that a father and his son from one of the two Bedouin tribes are standing. And they're standing facing another father and his daughter from the other Bedouin tribe. And they're discussing something earnestly. And a great sense of anticipation is in the air. Every eye is fixed on those two dads and their children. And the discussion often gets very intense. And you may have guessed already what we soon realized there that day. These two men are making arrangements for the young girl and the young boy to be married. And we all watch and listen in at this intense discussion. Suddenly, the discussion comes to an abrupt end. And if we thought it was quiet before, there is nothing like the heavy silence that descends on the crowd now. No one even dares to move a muscle. We don't even dare to breathe. The boy and his father sit down, and then the girl's father steps away, and as the lesser party in that culture to the marriage, the father of the bride comes back dragging a little lamb. The lesser party would go and get the animal for the covenant of marriage. He then uh, takes out a knife and gently cuts the lamb's throat in a way that's as painless as possible. And we all watch, in the deepening silence even, as that little lamb bleeds out and dies. And as we watch, we notice something. The lamb's blood is being carefully collected in a small depression in the dirt. Next, the father of the groom gets up as the greater party in that culture to this covenant of marriage. The father of the groom goes first. And this father, as we watch, steps up to the little pool of lamb blood. He removes his sandals. He looks to heaven. Then he looks to his son. And... He steps into the blood, and blood splashes everywhere. Those sitting nearby in the front row get speckled with it. That pungent smell of newly uh, shed blood fills the air. And what that old man is saying in the language of that culture in front of all of those witnesses is this. If my son isn't everything that I just promised, then you may do this to me. And let me tell you, if that boy is abusive, if that boy fails to live up to the promise of his father, you would, in that culture, without question, find that father's body in the bottom of a wadi or a canyon somewhere with his throat cut and footprints in his blood. Can you imagine your father putting his literal life on the line for the success of your marriage? The divorce rate is very, very low in the Bedouin culture, even today. Next, the father of the girl, the lesser party, goes second. And this man does the same thing in the blood, saying again in the language of the culture of that day, if my girl isn't everything I just promised, then you can do this to me. Now, Take this example of how a covenant is made back to our dear friend Abram. As the lesser party, certainly, 
to the covenant between Abram and God. Abram has already gone and got the animals and prepared the blood path, collecting it in one place. And there Abram stands, the blood path all prepared. What do you suppose Abram is thinking? Well, God's promise was to give Abram land and descendants, and as we know from other passages, one of whom would be Messiah. Does God have anything to worry about in keeping his promise? Well, no, he's God. But what about Abram? What was his obligation to this covenant? Do you remember? God said, walk before me, Abram, and be perfect. Oi! <laughs> Which, uh, quick translation is, oh no! I think Abram is standing there thinking, I'm a dead man. I can't be perfect. Maybe he's thinking something like, oh, what in the world was I thinking? As soon as I put my little toe in that blood, I'm dead. No land, no descendants, no Messiah, no nothing. Why didn't I just keep my big chutzpah mouth shut? When God says, I'll give you land, you just say thanks. You don't say prove it. Oy! And the Bible says this tells us what Abram is feeling here. You look it up. It says, a deep and dreadful darkness came over Abram. Well, no wonder. Years ago, we were traveling in Israel while I was leading a tour there, and um, our bus was passing a slow-moving truck uh, that was in front of us. And as we began to pass that truck, that truck sped up a little bit and we got caught in the passing lane. Suddenly around the bend in front of us came another bus heading right for us. And everyone in the bus got really quiet because it's one of those times if you've ever been caught trying to pass someone, you start to wonder in the back of your mind, am I going to get around this car in time because of the oncoming traffic? We did, but barely. The buses got closer and closer. Our driver suddenly swerved over, and as soon as we were over, that other bus came, boom, right by. And the Jewish guide we had there, I'll never forget, mumbled something in Hebrew. And I turned to him, his name was Boaz, and I said, what did you just say, Boaz? And Boaz said, huh, what I said was, the deep and dreadful darkness just came over me. And I just, I stared because... A little piece of scripture, even in Genesis, came alive. And so there's Abram feeling a deep and dreadful darkness, knowing that as soon as he steps into that blood, he's a dead man. But it's too late to back out now. And then we read in the Bible that a symbol shows up. And we read it passes through the path of blood. The symbol is a smoking fire pot. Smoke. Who does that often represent in the Bible? God. The pillar of smoke uh, um, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. The uh, top of Mount Sinai covered with smoke as God's presence descended on it. The temple being filled with smoke as a sign of God's presence. And in making a covenant, we would expect God to show up and go first, right? As the greater party to the covenant. And so in symbol, God shows up and in the cultural language of the day says to Abram, Abram? If I don't keep my promises, then you and your descendants can do this to me. Wow. God, in symbol, I understand, pledges to this shaking Bedouin man who probably can't even read his own life on his promise to provide land and descendants, one of whom would be Messiah. 
Well, now whose turn is it? Abram. Well, here goes. Abram must be thinking, time for me to die. But, just as Abram is about to seal his own doom by stepping into the blood, the Bible mentions a second symbol there with the first. A flaming torch shows up, and it too passes through the blood. Now, who in the text is often represented in the Bible? By fire. God, again the pillar, the burning bush, tongues of fire at Pentecost. And so, in symbol, God steps into the blood again. Twice. I picture Abram about to step in there at the last minute. God puts a firm hand on Abram's trembling arm and says, No, Abram, let me. And in symbol, God goes through that blood again and says to Abram in the language and culture of the day, Abram, if you or your descendants don't keep the covenant if you or they fail to be perfect then Abram you can do this to me God takes both sides and at that moment God sentenced Jesus Christ to death I picture Jesus in heaven that day watching his father pledge his life to a shaking Bedouin man somewhere in the middle of the desert in animal blood in the sand. P.S. And it's a rather big P.S., which I think you're used to from me by now. After that, at 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock every day, 9 a.m. in the morning, three o'clock in the afternoon, God's people made a certain kind of sacrifice in order to remind God to keep His promise to keep their end of the covenant for them too. You see, when Moses came along several centuries later, God had Moses put it down in writing and He told Moses, every day, Moses, at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m., have the people make a sacrifice using the same five animals that Abram used that day, you ever noticed? To remind me, God says, of my promise, and remind them as well, I'm sure, of the promise God made to Abram. And they did this for some 1,200 years. I... It went something like this. I don't know if you can see at least this rough schematic of tabernacle and the temple in Jerusalem followed it very closely. You see here uh, the outer court, also called the people's court, worship court, uh, maybe even uh, court of the Israelite or Israelites, Israel's court. You would find in there the great altar. On top of that altar, there would be a flint bloodstone where priests uh, would hold uh, the neck of the animal to be sacrificed against that stone, waiting for 9 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon to make that sacrifice. There was probably some channel that was um, um, flowing from that flint stone uh, to go ahead and collect that blood. And then um, once that blood was collected, it'd be thrown against the bottom three feet of that altar as a way to remind God to keep his promise to Abram. Incidentally, God also said, it's one of those examples where I think it shows God has a sense of humor, but I think it also shows that God wants a partner with his people. You remember last week's lesson, I think, 
and it surrounds that uh, bronze sea or lava in that outer courtyard, God says this, and I'll paraphrase, he says, okay, make one of those and fill it with water. And then God never tells them what to do with it. <laughs> and so you have uh, the rabbis and before them, uh, God's priests just huddling together, pouring into God's word, wondering, well, what, are, you know, what should we do with that? And two schools of thought, main schools of thought emerged. Well, somehow that blood, um, or that blood, the water in the bronze sea needed to be used before the sacrifice um, to ritually clean the sacrifice. Maybe the priests would uh, um, use the water to dedicate their head, heart, hands, and feet. Um, so that was one school of thought. And then a second school of thought was, no, uh, that water is somehow utilized for after the sacrifice, and they would argue back and forth. But I love that guy. Make one, put it there, and fill it with water, and then he doesn't say what to do with it. Leaves it to his people to decide. It's kind of like when God told them to tie tzitzit uh, strings to the corners of their round robe. Um, you can imagine the discussion on what are the corners of something round. Um, but anyway, that's uh, the outer courtyard. Next courtyard in, called uh, the holy place or the priest's court, in there you would find the table of showbread, you'd find an incense altar, you'd find a menorah with uh, seven branches, um, which was always lit, signifying... Um, that God is eternal. Um, this is a different lesson for a different time. The center candle of the menorah was called the light of the world in Jesus' day. Uh, no coincidence that when Jesus is uh, near the Temple Mount where a, a giant menorah even was burning, that Jesus uses light of the world as who he is. He's the light of the world. Um, the branch of that menorah from which all others were lit, perhaps. But that's a different lesson for a different time. And then finally, the Holy of Holies, where, of course, the Ark of the Covenant was put. Um, this schematic shows um, the Ark of the Covenant uh, facing this way. Uh, best biblical archaeological evidence suggests that God's uh, covenant was it was actually, or Ark of the Covenant was actually sideways so the poles could be slipped in uh, easily and maybe as a symbol that God was ready to move uh, with his people at least uh, when the tabernacle was up and running. So that was the basic layout at least of that uh, sacrificial system including that 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock ceremony. Now, by Jesus' day, as you can, uh, might imagine, the whole thing had become quite ritualized. The 9 o'clock a.m. and the 3 o'clock sacrifices were made every day on the altar of the great temple in Jerusalem. Thousands of people, and on holidays, hundreds of thousands, pressing into Jerusalem for these sacrifices. And every day at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., a priest would stand at the pinnacle of the Temple Mount and uh, with a shofar, that biblical instrument uh, translated as trumpet, but uh, a ram's horn. And at precisely 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock, while those sacrifices were being made, he would blow the trumpet, the shofar, to announce to everyone for miles around that right at that moment, God was being asked to, to remember his promise. So, I want you to imagine that you're out in the fields, you didn't make it to the sacrifice that day. And as you're working in the field, 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock uh, come near. And suddenly, right at 9 or right at 3, you would hear this sound echoing through the hills. Listen. <laughs> 
And you would pause, maybe look to heaven, bless the Lord, and you would know that at that moment, the sacrifice was being made to remind God to keep his promise to Abram, land, descendants, one of whom would be Messiah, and also forgiveness, grace, to take their place for not being perfect. Josephus, the historian, wrote that the sound of that shofar could be heard in Bethlehem some three and a half miles away. Now, I want to take you to one actual sacrifice that took place in history. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it's a Friday. And it's just about time for the afternoon sacrifice. And so it's five minutes before three o'clock. The high priest, a man named Caiaphas that day, was no doubt on the great altar to make the sacrifice because it was a high holy day. Some say the highest holy day in a seven-year period. And the best shofar blower in the country was waiting for three o'clock. Caiaphas waiting with the lamb's neck against the flint stone, ready to make the three o'clock sacrifice. The only difference on that particular Friday was that not far at all from the temple courts, there were three men hanging on crosses. And the one in the middle looked nearly dead. It was unusually dark that day, and so the time was probably being kept with an hourglass rather than the usual sundial. And as the last grain of sand dropped... It was three o'clock, and the signal was given. And the man in the middle cross rouses himself, perhaps at the sound of the shofar, perhaps waiting for that moment, the moment when God was being reminded to keep his promise. And one last time, he looked in vain toward his Father in heaven. And in the gagging, choking voice of a crucifixion victim, he screamed, Nishlam! It is finished. And Jesus dies at exactly three o'clock. You look it up. It's finished. Father, I kept your promise. Do you ever wonder if God has forgotten you? My friends, he hasn't forgotten his promise not to Abram, and not to you and me. Be encouraged for those times you're tempted to think maybe he has, he hasn't, he remembers, and he'll keep his promises. For 1,800 years, from Abram to Jesus, he remembered. For millennia longer, from Adam and Eve in the garden to Jesus, he remembered. Because he loves you. He loves you deeply and completely. 
he can't help it. He's head over heels in love with you. And he will keep his promise that one day he'll send his son again to truly take us truly home. Through thousands of years, through centuries, with powerful people thinking they were in control of things, even down to Passion Week and the events leading to the crucifixion and resurrection, the Sanhedrin in particular, Sadducees in Rome, thinking they were in charge of what was happening there. Just a coincidence that at the sound of the shofar, Jesus was being spiked to the cross, I suppose. Just a coincidence that only six hours later, right at three o'clock, as the shofar blew again, as people were crying out to God and the lamb's throat was being cut on the great altar, That's when God reached down and took the life of his son. Pilate remarks surprise and probably some disappointment in the Roman crucifixion squad when he hears Jesus is already dead, saying he was a strong man. I think that's a clue that Jesus didn't die of natural causes. He died as the intentional sacrifice and God took his son's life then, at that moment, finishing a promise he made 1,800 years before. Following through that because we're not perfect, he allowed us to do this to him. P.S., Maybe one reason why God doesn't give instructions on what to do with the lava in the Bronze Sea is linked to the fact that in the new temple of the new heaven and earth that the Bronze Sea is now a glass sea. There's no more water because the once and for all sacrifice has been made because God doesn't forget His promises He remembers you and me. And he'll keep on remembering until that day that he comes again at the sound of the shofar. I hope you had a blessed resurrection day. I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for being a God who keeps his promises, who puts his own life on the line as collateral and assurance. Perhaps especially for those times when we need it most, tough and challenging times. Father, I would ask that once again during this pandemic, You keep your promise in Romans through the Apostle Paul to be in the midst of any chaos and evil working for our good. We trust and know, Father, that you are. I'd ask that through all of this, people would come to know you for the first time. And I'd ask for those who have already known you that their relationship and trust and hope and assurance would deepen even more. Father, help us as followers of Jesus to be your light, your love, your healing to the world. Father, we love you. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Have a great week. God bless you all.